morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on our wonderful Thursday morning. We're uh, here today with uh, Burning Educator Julie Bridgman. We're going to go over uh, patchwork and or piecing and quilting basics. Uh, during the webinar, if you have a question, please enter it in the chat box on your right hand control panel. We'll have a question answer session at the end, and I will ask Julie as many questions as we can uh, as time pertains and to the subject matter. Uh, if you have any audio or visual difficulties during the webinar, please exit the webinar and rejoin. Uh, that solves most issues. Just make sure you have all of your other tabs on your browser closed for optimal uh, internet. And the webinar is being recorded, so if you miss any part of the webinar, not to worry. It'll be posted on Bernina.com and YouTube uh, in a few days. So I'd like to welcome Bernina educator Julie Bridgman. Hi, Julie. Hello. Thanks, Emily. And welcome, everyone. Welcome to Bernina Piecing and Quilting Basics. I'm Julie Bridgman, educator with Bernina of America. And today I am talking about making quilts. I love the process of making quilts from the piecing to the basting, quilting the top, all the way to the binding. This webinar is for new sewists and experienced sewists who want to make quilts and get off on the right foot. So let's talk feet. The first part of quilt making is piecing the top or piecing your quilt blocks. So let me get my pointer here so you can see better. Right here is a block that is pieced together with these half square triangles. Now to get that nicely pieced, you need the right foot. And Bernina has your patchwork feet for you. There are three patchwork feet. And these patchwork feet make your perfect quarter inch seam allowance all these quilt blocks are pieced together with a quarter inch seam allowance. The patchwork feet are 37, 57, and 97. Each of these have two versions. There is the version with just the number, and there's the version with the letter D after the number. The letter D stands for dual feed. And you'll know what dual feed is if you have the machine with the dual feed mechanism. This mechanism is in the back of the machine and it comes down and attaches to the foot. The Bernina 570, 590, 740, 770, 790, and 880 all have this capability. If your machine does not, then you do not want to use the dual feed um, foot. You'll use the 37, 57, or 97. Here is the 37. The 57 has a guide bar right here that's attached to the foot that helps line up your fabric. And then the 97 has a guide that attaches to the um, bed of the sewing machine. And also the 97 is meant for the nine millimeter machines. So your stitch plate, um, it, you've either got the 5.5 millimeter machine or the larger nine millimeter machine. And the nine millimeter machine has a wider feed dog. And so the 97 accommodates the wider feed dog. And with that, it, so it has the bigger sole. Here on this PowerPoint, I have two pictures. And these are the soles of the patchwork feet. This is the 37 and the 57. And this one's wider one is the 97. And I, am, I have these here just so I can show you why these are patchwork feet. You see on each toe, there's this right toe and a left toe, and this is your quarter inch mark. You will place your fabric under the toe, it lines up right under the toe and makes your quarter inch seam allowance. If you line up your fabric inside the left toe or the right toe, you're gonna get your eighth inch seam allowance. There are also markings or these divots in the foot that is a quarter inch in front of your needle center and a quarter inch behind your needle center. And the needle center is right here. This is where your needle is. On this side, we have the 97, which is wider. This right side is exactly the same. It's the left side that's different because you've got the extra width here. So your quarter inch mark is going to be inside this left toe. 
And the eighth inch mark is right here on, marked on that foot. But everything else is the same. If you've not played around with the patchwork feet, uh, go into your local dealer if they're open and try diff the different feet and see what works for you. Um, it really comes down to preference. Unless you don't have the dual feed mechanism, do not uh, buy the dual feed foot. But you, depending on who you talk to, some quilters prefer the 37, some the 57, and some the 97. Now, for your, you might have heard the term scant quarter inch seam allowance if you've been in the quilting world for a bit. This term is, is very important. And you might be wondering, what does this mean and why is it so important? Well, the scant quarter inch allowance, the scant quarter inch seam is going to be just a hairline shorter, smaller than your quarter inch seam allowance. So for example, here's a stitch plate and I'm showing you right here your quarter inch mark on the stitch plate. So your seam, your scant quarter inch seam is going to be just to the left of this mark. So you're going to line your fabric up just to the left of that mark. So the mark is still visible. That is going to be your scant quarter inch. Now, why? Why do you need to do a scant quarter inch? What's the big deal? Well, when you have when you're sewing your seam allowances together and you have your quarter inch seam, and then you press it, fold it over and press it, you've got this fold over allowance. This fold over allowance here, it doesn't matter, you can press this as flat as it can get, you're still going to have that hairline of fabric that we call a fold over allowance. So your scant quarter inch seam allowance plus that fold over allowance will equal a quarter inch seam. So if you're not sure what you have or what you've been doing on your machine, piece seam blocks, do a test. I want you to cut three strips of fabric, one and a half inch by three, and sew them together. Now, when you sew them together, measure that middle piece. This here, should be exactly one inch. If it's too big, your seam allowance is too small. If it's too small, your seam allowance is too big. So adjust accordingly, keep trying until you get this right and you know exactly where you need to be. This is really important. And you might wonder, well, it's only a hairline. Like, is it really that important? Well, when you're doing quilt blocks, and you, you know, quilt blocks have lots of little pieces. You know, you can start out with, um, as a beginner, with a triple rail like this. But as you get more and more advanced, you're going to start doing pieces like this. And you might just have, if you're a hairline off here and here and here and here, well, even if that's just 1 16th, with those four, you've already got about a quarter inch off. So it adds up quickly. And then you're piecing all these blocks together with other blocks, and it 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 really does snowball. So, um, and especially when you're doing blocks with points, like here, you don't want to have to if your quilt block's too big or too big, and you have to trim down a little bit. If you're doing squares like this, it's not as big a deal. But when you're doing points, you're and you're going to be cutting off your points. Okay, so make sure you practice that and test it and see that um, you can get that one inch mark for you. But with this burning, with the Bernina feet, with the 37, the 57, and the 97, you line it up right here to the left of that mark so you can see the mark, but not so much that you see more of the stitch plate also. You want it just right next to that mark. And if you have it next to that mark, it's going to feed under the feet nicely. If it's under the foot and you can see the fabric a little bit on the right, it's, it's too far over. That, the fabric should be right under that sole, kind of flush with the sole. 
Okay, so once you've got your top pieced, it, you are ready to baste the sandwich. What is the sandwich? The sandwich is your backing, your backing fabric, your batting, and then your top. That's the sandwich. So you need to find a way to secure these before you go to quilting the top. So there's different ways you can do this. You can spray baste with a temporary spray adhesive, such as a 505 spray is is a real common one. You can pin baste. If you pin baste, I recommend using these curved pins. You can buy safety pins that are curved like this. That will save your fingers. There's also a product called a quick clip and it looks like this. And this is to open and close the pins. That saves your fingers and it makes the process a lot faster. You can machine baste. On your Bernina, most of the machines have a basting stitch, which is basting stitch number 21 right here. It's in your practical stitch menu. Go to 21. You can increase that stitch length all the way to the maximum of six. And what this basting stitch does, it stitches every fourth stitch. So you've got your at six millimeters times four, that's 24 millimeters. So you're almost at an inch. Your basting stitch is almost an inch. It's about seven eighths. So that's another way you can baste or you can do the hand basting with your hand sewing needle and thread. And once you do that, you will want to quilt your um, top. That's the next part of the process. So I'm gonna go over directional quilting. Um, there's also free motion quilting, there's ruler work, there's other techniques, but we're going to go over directional quilting today, and that's using Bernina walking foot number 50. Now, this foot has three soles. There is a standard sole right here, and this sole has a line in, I can grab this, there is a line right in the center here. Um, let me see if I can, I'll stop sharing my screen so you can see a bigger picture. Emily, can you just see me now? Yes. Okay, so there's a line or a divot right here in the foot. And when I'm doing line quilting where I need to follow a marked line, this is perfect because you can follow that mark line with this divot in the foot right there and get it nice and straight. Um, the walking foot also comes with a, um, let me just grab this whole box here, an open sole. This one I really like for decorative stitches and it also comes with a center guide. And there is this center blade in the middle of the sole. And this is for stitch in the ditch. The foot also comes with a left and a right guide for line quilting, which I will go over soon. And these are guide bars. Okay, so, and the walking foot also, the reason we use this for quilting the top is there are uh, rubber feet on the top of this. So these are working with the feed dog, moving all layers of the quilt. So that's why it's really important to, to use this foot when you're using, um, when you're doing the quilt top and you've got the three layers in there, you want all those layers moving at the same time. You don't want anything shifting. The basting definitely helps secure it too. Um, so between the basting and this walking foot, you're keeping all those layers nice and secure until you get your quilting done. So let's talk about what you can do with this walking foot. Let me go back to my slide here. We have stitch in the ditch quilting. Emily, can you see my slide again? Yes. Okay, so stitch in the ditch quilting is along the seam line and it's with the seams pressed to one side and then the guide because you'll use your sole with the center guide, it will fall into the lower side, the side without the seam allowances. So for example, with this quilt block, 
this guide goes right in that seam. If you have this guide, the center guide, right in that seam, you're going to get those stitches right in the seam and they won't be noticeable. You can even use a slightly thinner thread than what you usually do and that helps with keeping it invisible. And then you have your seams pressed to one side here. And then you've got pressing those seams to one side is what creates the ditch. And this goes right in the ditch. Now, if you are um, a quilter that presses your seams open, I've noticed a lot of quilters are doing that lately is pressing their seams open. Uh, I wouldn't recommend stitch in the ditch, especially if this is something that's gonna go on the sofa or on a bed, uh, that will weaken the stitches. Maybe if it, it'll be okay if it's something that will go up on the wall but I wouldn't recommend stitch in the ditch for uh, seams that are pressed open. Um, I referenced here, we also, we also is Bernina's creative sewing blog that we have lots of tutorials. Uh, you can find anything on there about Bernina products, Bernina projects, Bernina sewing techniques. There's a wealth of information. So go there, check it out if you've never been, get on the mailing list and um, look up Stitch in the Ditch with Walking Foot number 50. In there, you'll see more detail on how to do this technique and um, lots of pictures and exactly what's going on. Okay, now we have our line quilting. So another thing you can do with the walking foot is line quilting. And this is when it looks like this when you are doing straight lines and they are in even rows next to each other. So this is about a half inch, this is about an inch. And then I have, and this is where you, I mean the half inch, you can use the, the foot as a guide. Once you get more than a half inch, you'll have to use the right or the left seam guide to get your one inch. And to start this, what you need to do is mark a line. You need to use a temporary marker and then mark a straight line, stitch that. And then after that, you can either use your foot, the stitch plate, the foot, or the guide bar, depending on how far apart your lines are, as the guide for your straight lines. But you only have to do your mark with the temporary marker once. This is the matchstick. I'm sure matchstick's been really popular, popular lately. This matchstick, they're an eighth inch apart. And with this, Emily, can you see this okay or should I go to the bigger screen? Uh, go to the bigger screen, please. Okay, let me do that. Perfect. So matchstick is only an eighth. Can you see that okay? Maybe. I I don't know if you can see the lines in there, but this is a quarter inch apart. This is an eighth inch, there's an eighth inch over here. And you can tell like when you, depending how close you are with any design, whether it's the straight lines or a cross hatch grid, the further apart the lines are, you're creating a motif. The closer the lines are, like here, you're creating more of a texture. So you kind of want to think about what, what your goal is for the quilt or that part of the quilt. Are you wanting more texture in it or do you want some motif to show? Um, so spacing is something to think about. So this is the matchstick and with the matchstick you'll do quarter inch. The easiest way to do it is to make your quarter inch straight lines and then to go back and put, make your eighth inch lines. So you'll do another line in between your quarter inch. And that, it sounds like that's gotta be a pain, but it's super easy with the walking foot. And I didn't think I'd like it, but I really did actually like this because you can take your walking foot and when you go back to do your eighth inch lines, the, the quarter inch lines fit the guide right between those toes. So it's so easy to get that eighth inch, those eighth inch lines. It's a lot easier than it looks. Okay, next I have crosshatch and crosshatch are grids and you can do crosshatch straight 
This one's diagonal, straight they would be squares. This is diagonal, so they're more like diamonds. You could also get more of an angle where you would do your second line at maybe a 30 degree angle. And, and you can space these however you want. These are about one inch apart. So again, if you space these closer together, even just a half inch, you're going to get more texture. Quarter inches definitely get more texture, then you're going to lose, um, you won't see the shapes as much. This one is uh, curved. So this is a curved cross hatch on this side. And this one started with a curve that I just did. I didn't mark it or anything. I just kind of curved with my walking foot and then I echoed that first line. So you could start in the middle and then go to the right and go to the left, echo the lines and then go the other way and you get that nice curved grid. So next we have wavy quilting. So you're, my point is with the walking foot, you can do a lot more than just your straight lines. There's a lot you can do with the walking foot. So we have the wavy lines, which also, which are, these are kind of organic. I just, um, I didn't follow a pattern. I just went for it. That's a lot of fun. And this one here, at the bottom of this sample here, I've got wavy line echoed. So I echoed the wavy lines. And let me go back to my screen here so I can show you. And then there's orange peel. And orange peel is a popular um, one uh, design that you actually can do with your walking foot. So this is orange peel here. And you see this a lot on quilts. And each row here is actually a continuous line. There aren't stops and stops, starts and stops between rows. So what you do is you start at the top and the easiest way I found to remember is you go down the stairs, across the room, up the stairs, down the stairs, across the room, up the stairs, down the stairs, across the room, up the stairs, across the ceiling. And then you do the same for each row and you start up here, go down the stairs. That was and it sounds really simple, but when you have your quilt on your machine and your, it, it does tend to get a bit confusing. So that's an easy way to remember it. Um, also, if you are a beginner, never done a quilt, or maybe you've done a couple, I recommend not starting with a queen size quilt. Start with a table topper or anything up to maybe a lap size. That way, when you go to the basting and the quilting, you're not overwhelmed. You've got a piece that you can work with, that you can easily maneuver, and um, it won't be frustrating for you because as a beginner, you don't want to be frustrated. So you make this uh, process um, easy for you and start with something that's maybe a lap size or smaller. Don't start with the queen size. Okay, so next we have um, I wanted to point out, uh, we also, we have a post there called Quilting with the Walking Foot. Check that out. That's a really good post uh, on the walking foot and what you can do with it. And there's also a book called Walk. You've probably heard a lot about it lately. It's The Walk 2, because she just came out with her second book. It's Walk 2.0. Um, the first book I have, and this is by Jackie Gehring, and she does amazing things with the walking foot including this point-to-point -point quilting with radiating lines, and she has an orange peel variation. So the point-to-point -point quilting is kind of like dot-to-dot. -dot. You've done dot-to-dot, -dot, where you uh, make lines, and then she shows you where to put the dots, and all you have to do is follow the dots. So it, like this one, it's a lot easier than it looks. So this looks pretty complicated. This is the orange peel variation. But it is, um, it's actually a lot easier than it looks. It's amazing. The other last one I wanted to talk about is quilting with decorative stitches. You can use your walking foot with your decorative stitches. So make a sample. Find some decorative stitches you like that you think, ooh, those would be really good on my quilt. And make a sample with them. 
And um, also, you can remember, you can adjust the length and the width and uh, play around with that. The two most popular ones with decorative stitches will be your wavy line or your serpentine line and a scallop. So most machines will have these two stitches. They're different numbers depending on your machine. I have the 790, and on that machine, the scallop is number 719. And, the, and then um, I think the wavy and the serpentine, there's three of them. They, they might be in the, I think they're in the quilting menu, uh, stitches menu. Okay, so I am going to play a video. It's a made to create video we do. There's 60 second videos that we put on our Instagram. And our Instagram is Bernina USA. And we make these 60 second videos that, and then we have a link to the We Also blog with more detail. So the videos are fast. They're not meant to be followed and sewing and following. They're just fast, fun videos. And then if you like it, you can click on the link to um, the We All Sew post to, for more detail and pictures. But let me play this for you because I thought it'd be a really nice um, example of the wavy stitch. Bernina, made to create. Okay, so you'll notice in the video that Haley used stitch number four. So if you don't have that wavy stitch, you can use stitch number four and adjust that, adjust the length. Um, but you can find that on wealso.com. Okay, let's go on. Now, once you have your top quilted, you are going to your binding. Binding, traditional binding is called French binding. You might have heard double fold binding or double binding. They're all the same, so just different names. Why? Why do we want to do a double fold binding? A double fold binding has two layers. So let me show you. Let's see. So when you have your binding it has two layers of fabric and then it's folded over so there's two layers in here well your edge of your quilt gets a lot of wear and tear so this double fold is making the binding stronger so that's why all i only do french binding um, all the traditional quilts are french binding I, that's the way i recommend and on this one, I want, I'm going to play video and I'm going to talk over the video to kind of explain what's going on. For the, to attach it, you want to attach it with a quarter inch seam allowance. I use a walking foot. Um, some people use their patchwork foot. I just prefer a walking foot. Either way is fine, just works better, what works better for you. You'll find in sewing that there's many different ways to get the same result. And sometimes it just comes down to what works better for you or how you've learned. And I just prefer the walking foot. Remember you're sewing through five layers. You've got your back, your batting, your top, and then your two layers of the binding. So that's five layers. Uh, I'm gonna show in the video how to do a miter corner and then how to join the tail ends. 
at the very end of your binding, once you have the whole binding stitched on one side, you wrap it to the back side. I usually sew my binding on the front side, and then you wrap it to the back side and you'll slip stitch it or blind stitch it um, by hand. Oh, and here I referenced weallsew.com, how to sew mitered corners. That's one that I did uh, and it um, is very detailed with pictures and instructions on how to get that nice crisp corner. Okay, so here I'm um, showing how to, where I, I'm just joining my binding strips. So I have my binding strips cut to two and a quarter. It can be two and a quarter to two and a half. Um, you can do your binding strips on the bias. That's recommended a lot of times. Sometimes I don't just because I don't have enough fabric. And as long as it's just a rectangular quilt and there are no curves, I've never had any issue just cutting on the straight of grain. So I'm. I'm joining my binding strips here. And any of this, if you need to go into more detail, go on to wealso.com and look up binding strips. And then what you'll want to do is um, cut off the excess. So you cut that this excess seam allowance off. Okay, now I am sewing on the binding to my uh, quilt. And I usually sew on the front of the quilt. Now I'm getting to the corner. And this is where you want to miter your corner. So you take, take the quilt out, don't cut the thread, just gently pull it out. And then you're gonna do a 45 degree angle here. And then fold down. So all the raw edges are even with the, the binding and the quilt. All the raw edges are even and then you're going to put that back under your foot at the quarter inch mark and continue sewing down that side. And I'll show the next corner too. I think that might, the visual might be a little bit better on this next corner. Okay, so here I'm at my corner. You wanna sew to just about a quarter inch. When you're about a quarter inch from the corner, then you fold the binding back at a 45 degree angle and then fold, and then fold it front towards you so that the raw edges are flush and that top folded edge is flush with the edge of the quilt. And then you go ahead again and put it under the foot and you wanna place it under the foot about a quarter inch and then stitch all the way down to your next corner. Okay, so here you've got everything stitched. Now you wanna join your tail ends. So you've got two rot ends that need to be joined and you join them just like you would join your binding strips. Here I'm showing you that I cut a piece of the binding and that's my width, that's two and a quarter. So you want this top part here, it needs to have an excess, this top tail has to have an excess of two and a quarter inch because that's the width of my binding. If my binding was two and a half inch, I'd want this access to be two and a half.
And then what you do is we're going to pin this and sew it corner to corner, just like you would when you put the binding strips together. It gets a little fiddly here because you have, it's attached to your quilt. So you wanna make sure that you leave about 10 to 12 inches unstitched so you have room to work with. So just go ahead and pin it and then you can mark it if you want. I just, I eyeballed it, but you probably wanna mark it if you're a beginner and then you're going to stitch corner to corner. Okay, and then you take that out, cut your thread, and when you open it there, it should all line up nicely. Okay, so that was attaching the binding in a nutshell. And there are different other kinds of binding. We have bow piped binding, which is right here. And this is on We All Sew. I have a tutorial on there on how to do faux piped binding. So this looks right here, this kind of coral color, this looks like piped, like it's a piped piece, but it's actually just your binding strip. So you have two colors on your binding strip. So I have two pieces of fabric that I sew together to create my binding strip. And one is a quarter inch bigger than the other. So when I fold them in half, you're going to see that second color peeking out. And that's how you get the faux pipe binding look. This is a lot of fun to do. Um, there is also a scalloped binding here, and there's a wavy binding. Now with your wave and your scallop, you definitely want to do a bias binding. You wanna cut that fabric, those fabric binding strips on the bias. And with this wavy binding, I will have a blog post on we also in the next few months, we'll post there. And here I used the Bernina binder foot attachment number 88 and the binder foot number 95 and attached the wavy binding, which is super fun and pretty fast too. So I recommend though, if your beginner is to start with the French fold binding, and that is a good place to start. And now you're done. So I just wanted to show, emphasize, it's not about the finish line and getting it done. Um, quilt making is more about the process. And that's what I love about it. I love the process of quilt making. Um, if I had to pick a favorite, I would say it would be piecing. I love to the piecing part and playing with the different colors and doing different kinds of blocks. Um, I love the quilting and sewing community. If you go online and look around quilting on any social media or just Google, it's amazing how big the quilting and sewing community is. And it's super fun. I have um, a oppressor foot class coming up. It's in person May 25th and 27th at our new creative center. So if you is something you're interested in, it is all about presser feet and accessories and it's 101. So it is um, great for those who uh, want to learn all about the different presser feet. Because Bernina has uh, over a hundred different presser feet and accessories. Um, so I have this picture here. These are my half square triangles. And these, this little block, this is a two inch block. This is where I started. This is where I started to get to this. And this is the quilt that I had at the beginning of the presentation. 
And this was my COVID quilt. This is a quilt I made. Everyone had their COVID projects. And it was funny because I started this quilt before the pandemic hit and it's called Corona, but it's for Corona, California. This pattern's by Laundry Basket Quilts. And COVID hit and I thought, well, I guess I should finish this. It's kind of fitting, ironic. And I did, and I thought for sure I would never finish this before the pandemic ended and I was very wrong. I finished it about three months. Who knew this was going to last so long? But um, I hope that you enjoyed, enjoyed this webinar. And I hope if you're a new sewist beginning that you will dive into quilting. And if um, you've made several quilts already, I hope you learned something new. And now, uh, Emily, do we have any questions? Hey, hi everybody, welcome back. Uh, we have a few questions, Julie. We had a couple people ask about uh, when you were going over the scant quarter inch. Uh, a few uh, of our attendees wanted to know if you can you move the needle position over one to achieve the same goal. <clears throat> you can. I don't recommend it though. Uh, with the stitch plate. I recommend using the straight stitch plate. You've got the, the stitch plate that has the slit that you can do decorative stitches with. And then there's a stitch plate that just has the hole, it's a straight stitch plate. And that's the one I recommend for piecing. Um, it helps um, get that nice straight stitch, and that nice quarter inch seam allowance. And so saying that, with that stitch plate, you can't move your needle over because you'll break your needle. I don't recommend doing that. I just, I recommend just do, getting that quarter inch seam allowance with the patchwork foot with in the center needle position with your straight stitch plate. That's just my recommendation. Okay. Uh, a couple of our attendees asked about um, when piecing is the dual feed better uh, than the walking foot or vice versa. Um, can you talk about the differences there? When piecing, you don't want to use your walking foot. Um, you want to use your patchwork foot. Um, for piecing the quilt blocks, you want to use the 37, the 57, or the 97. Okay, the walking foot is for when you want to, you're doing multiple layers, like when you're doing quilting the quilt top. So you've got your top, your batting, and your backing. So um, piecing, you want to use the Bernina patchwork foot. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Jan. She's asking about t-shirt quilts, which I know you are an expert on. Uh, she wants to know, does the walking foot work best for t-shirt quilt material? <clears throat> I've done a few of those. Yes, you can. Um, I have, yes, I have used actually the walking foot on the t-shirt material because it's, it's that stretchy knit. And I, and I do uh, use a uh, light interfacing for on the knit first, and then I cut the block. And that is a time um, I might, yeah, I would use the walking foot. Walking foot's good also for dealing with difficult material. <laughs> uh, fun question, really quick. Uh, Mary wants to know, uh, which uh, Bernina models do you use uh, for quilting? Well, for quilting, I use, I have a Bernina 790, and I also have a Bernina 330, which is kind of more my smaller, travel machine and so uh, I use both of them just kind of depends what I'm doing okay let's see uh <laughs> got a machine behind her uh let's see how is the French binding completed on the back side of the quilt so after you sew stitch on the binding in the front and then you fold the um fold it let's see um, 
Let's do this. So if you also want, if you're going to show a sample, please uh, turn off your screen sharing so we can oh. see the, the larger picture. Perfect. So you've stitched on the binding, and then this goes to the back. And you are going, the traditional way to do it is to hand stitch this with a slip stitch or a blind hem stitch by hand, the blind stitch by hand. And because this is already stitched on, when you fold over that mitered corner, you'll get a nice mitered corner also. And you just, it's just a quick slip stitch. Something I would I do like when I'm watching TV or listening to a podcast. That's what I save that for. And it goes it goes really quick. And you want to match your thread with the backing fabric. Okay. Uh, let's see. Joyce had a question about uh, stitching in the ditch. Uh, she asked, "Do you really want to stitch in the ditch with the seams pressed open? Will stitching be on the top of the seam line stitching?" Or do I stitch a touch to the left or to the right? Yeah, if you have a quilt where you've had to, for whatever reason, or you just prefer to press your seams open, I do not recommend stitching in the ditch. It will weaken the seams, especially if it's something that you're going to use a lot. It's going to be on the couch or the bed. I would recommend uh, doing, yeah, stitching maybe to a little to the left or the right of that seam, but not in the ditch. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, a question about uh, mitering corners. Uh, when mitering the corners for the binding, when you get to the corner, do you stop a quarter inch from the corner? After folding the miter, do you start sewing from the edge or the quarter inch in? Okay, yeah, stop about a quarter inch. Um, it's not something you have to be super exact with, but try, and what you can do is you can mark it. If you're worried, you can uh, mark it before you, before you get there. So you know where that quarter inch mark is. And then when you turn it, you wanna put your foot down and put your foot down so that needle will start just on the, um, about right around that quarter inch, maybe an eighth inch. It doesn't have to be exact there um, because you're going to you're going to turn it over. You can, if you're worried though, you could do a little back stitch there too. But I've I've never had issue with it. Sometimes I okay. do it fast. Uh, Janice uh, wanted to know if you can go over the really fun uh, rhyme to remember your uh, quilting. <laughs> Okay. If you can go over the that again slowly so uh, Janice can write that down. I did not come up with it. I don't know where. I saw, probably saw it in a book somewhere. So you go down the stairs, across the room, up the stairs, down the stairs, cross the room, up the stairs, down the stairs, cross the room. And you keep going, just depends how many blocks you have. And then you're going to end up the stairs. And then you go all across the ceiling, all the way back, and that's it. That is super fun to remember. So hopefully, Janice, you got that on there. Okay, uh, Jan wants to know, what do you use to mark your quilt? Um, I'm guessing if uh, you want to put placement lines or guidelines, is there anything that you recommend? There's a lot, there are a lot of products out there. I recommend, I, I mean, I like to use either chalk or have this uh, here it is, the um, blue one, the Styla. It's a water erasing one. I've had, I like this one. If, sometimes I'll use chalk. Um, the only one I, I'm hesitant to use if I know it's something where the mark, you know, is not going to be in a seam allowance, then uh, is the Frixon ones. You, a lot of people use those. And uh, sometimes you might, you could have a little ghosting with that where you, you might just see a faint little 
shadow once in a while. So I wouldn't really recommend that if it's something that is not going to be cut out or sewn into your seam allowance. But I really like this style one. Style one and um, chalk. Wonderful. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mary wanted to know uh, on your Corona quilt, uh, who was the designer on that? Was it laundry basket quilts? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, it's a laundry basket quilt pattern. Yeah, she had um, done, a, there was a lot of applique on it too, which I, I didn't do the applique part. And uh, Nancy wanted to know, uh, she's using uh, pre-cuts that have the pinked edges. So uh, she wanted to know where should the quarter inch measurement be located if she's using a pre-cut? Well, it depends. Um, if you're doing a pre-cut, say like a jelly roll and it's supposed to be, it's two and a half inch, I would definitely measure it. Um, depends who cut it. <laughs> But measure it make sure and see, a lot of times that two and a half inch is going to be from that point to point of the, where they use the pinking shears. So that's where you'll need to do your seam allowance is, your, is from the, the end of that point. So what you could do though, to make it easier is just back it, when you put your two pieces together, maybe back it with, a fabric that is straight that doesn't have the pinking and then place the pre-cut on top of that and then line up those points with your the the straight fabric or the fabric with the straight um cut and that that should help a lot oh, did that make sense <laughs> uh uh, looks like Jeannie, uh, she wanted to know the name of that, uh, the blue marking pen, if you could spell it out. Sure. Is This one is a watery racing one. I think they have other kinds. Styla is S-T-Y-L-A. And if you put that in Google, Styla water racing, it will pop right up. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, Janet had a question about the walking foot. Can the walking foot be used with only certain decorative stitches or any decorative stitches? It can be used with any decorative stitch that is 5.5 up to a maximum of a 5.5 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And that is all for our questions today. So thank you everyone for a wonderful morning session. And as a reminder, the video of today's recording will be online uh, on YouTube and Bermina.com in a few days. And uh, if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to uh, email Julie or myself and we can get those questions answered for you. So have a wonderful day, everybody, and happy sewing. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.